So again, welcome to the Flyway Nights um, for the winter of 2020. And the Yellow Basin Foundation is proud to have Rachel sharing with us. I'm going to let you actually, Rachel, introduce yourself and your project. And so I'm going to turn on your spotlight and let you take over. Um, and just so as one more, um, I will uh, also be kind of monitoring the chat box. Um, so if people have questions and they want to type it in chat, you can do that. But otherwise, if you'd go ahead and leave yourself on mute so that uh, we don't have background noise for our speaker. So take it away, Rachel. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rochelle, and I've been working with uh, Salmon on the bypass for the last two years. And let me see if I can get this to go. Can you guys see my screen okay? Okay. Um, so this is this year's uh, Salmon on the Rice Project update. So as you guys know, historically, the Central Valley was known for its floodplain habitat. But through the years, a lot of this has been converted over for agricultural use. And today, only about 5% of managed wetland habitat remains. At the same time, we're also seeing a dramatic decrease in the number of Chinook salmon returning to the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. And this is important because we know how valued floodplains are for rearing habitat for juvenile salmon. And so for us, it became how do we meet our agricultural and societal needs, but at the same time help salmon. And one way that we've been doing this is actually planting salmon on rice fields um, because of their ability uh, to act as floodplains. They're essentially agricultural floodplains. So why should we care about salmon on rice fields? So previous research has shown that these rice fields provide suitable rearing habitat for juvenile salmon. In fact, they grow bigger and faster. And you can see in these pictures, it's actually pretty dramatic how much bigger they get in a short amount of time. And so the success of these studies got us wondering, how does rice field rearing relate to their survival as they head out to the ocean? And can rice fields be a reconciliation approach to helping salmon in off-channel habitat? So for this year's study, we had four main objectives. We decided to conduct a survival study within rice fields to look at their infield survival. And the reason we did this is a lot of the management agencies have concerns about how many fish can actually survive in these fields given bird predation. We also wanted to add in habitat complexity to see if it would give additional protection for these fish against predation. We also wanted to compare growth rates between two different rice farms in the area. And then we used acoustic telemetry to track fish from the city of Sacramento all the way out to the Golden Gate Bridge. So for our study design, we had two main treatments. We had our rice treatment fish and our control treatment. So our rice field treated fish were divided between River Garden Farms and Nags Ranch. And then due to COVID-19, we ended up with a third group known as our rice lab fish. For our control treatment, we had fish that came from Coleman National Fish Hatchery, but an unexpected infection in those fish resulted in us having to pull fish from Nimbus Fish Hatchery as well. So to give some context on where all this was happening, in the upper left-hand corner, we have River Garden Farms, which is located right next to the city of Knight's Landing, and it's right next to the Sacramento River. Then we have Nags Ranch farther down in the Yolo Bypass, and finally, we have our control fish that were housed at the UC Davis Center for Aquatic Biology and Aquaculture. So for our infield survival study, we did this solely at River Garden Farms. And what we did was we had eight half acre plots with four different treatment types. We had wood and canals, a control treatment with no type of additional habitat, wood treatment, and then canals. And the reason we did this is we wanted to see if canals added a type of depth refugia for the fish against predation. And we thought maybe that large woody debris did as well. And our controls were set up because we wanted to make sure if these treatments actually made a difference for our fish. So I wanna take you guys back to about a year ago before we sheltered in place, when we were all enjoying the holidays with our families and our friends and having nice warm dinners together. Well, while you guys were out enjoying your dinners, my crew and I 
where like the Grinch who stole Christmas and we went around your neighborhoods and picked up all of your discarded Christmas trees. And we did this because to do our large woody debris treatment, we needed to have enough trees. And considering the time of year, Christmas trees were the easiest things to get. So we had trees ranging in size from four to five feet, five to six feet, six to seven and seven and above. And each plot that required a woody debris treatment got 30 trees each. So to do our infield survival, we planted a thousand fish within each plot. And we used a 25 foot long seine net in order to collect these fish. The first 30 fish collected from each plot were then used to get growth and weight data. And all fish, we removed their adipose fin as a way for us to mark them. That way we knew if we caught them later on, we had previously had captured them. Any fish that was greater than 50 millimeters, we inserted a pit tag into them, which gave them a unique identification number, which allowed us to get population estimates as well as obtain individual growth rates. By the end of our survival study, we had to drain the fields, which meant trying to get as many of the fish off the field as possible. So we did this between March 2nd and the 11th. And the reason it took us this long is we could only drain one field per night. And the reason they took place at night is we wanted to reduce the amount of stress that the fish went through. And so as you can see in the upper left-hand corner here, that's me actually setting up the antenna. Over to the right, that is my technician, Jordan, actually setting up the cage where the fish will enter. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you can kind of see this mesh screen. That's what was keeping our fish in the fields the whole time. And so we have to remove that before draining the fields. And in the bottom left-hand corner, that is what we call active draining, which means my technician is pulling out the boards. We consider the field is draining and fish are coming through that receiver. So any fish we had previously pit tagged, we're gonna get recorded by our antenna. But at the end, we had to work up every single fish, which meant every non-pit tagged fish was hand counted by me and my crew. And the way that these fields were set up, they didn't actually drain completely. So this meant the next morning, my crew and I went out with nets and re every small pool that was in the fields because we were determined to get as many fish as we could off of them. And so the results we found is that for the most part, the number of fish that came off these fields was pretty similar to each other, except for if you see at the bottom, that blue line with the blue circle, and that was a canal treated group. I call that plot plot eight. It was the furthest plot from all my others, and we kind of had a feeling it was gonna have the lowest survival. There was a bunch of birds that would hang out on it. And after talking with some researchers at the Center of Watershed Sciences, they had mentioned that in previous studies, it was always the furthest field that had the lowest survival. We're not sure if it's because of bird predation, but we suspect that there might be a water quality issue going on at that end. But I wanted to make sure that they were definitely, it was significant. So I ran a Tsuki HSD test to see if there was a difference between my groups. And the p-value that I got was 0.639 for plots one through eight. And that's a pretty high number. And so I wanted to rerun it without plot eight because I thought it was kind of screwing up my data. So I did, and I got a p-value that was way more significant, which confused me. And I, saw, I spoke to my professor and he had mentioned that the reason for this is our sample size for each treatment is relatively small. We only had two groups for each treatment. But overall, what we found is you don't need to add habitat complexity to have good survival within these fields. The next thing we did is we wanted to look at growth between the fish that we reared at River Garden versus the fish that we reared on the bypass at NAGS. And so in the orange here, you can see that these are the fish and their mean mass when we got them from Coleman Fish Hatchery. And they were planted on February 5th. Um, a week later, we actually planted the fish at NAGS. And then from then on, green became our control group at UC Davis, pink being River Garden and purple being NAGS. And as you can see, both of the rice treatment groups had much better growth compared to my control group. And what was most exciting was actually to see that nags, even though they were planted a week later, had way better growth compared to River Garden. And so this got me interested to see what was going on within my fields. 
So this is the data that I collected off a sensor that I had in my field. And what it shows is, if you guys can remember, at the end of February, we had like a really warm spell. And what happened was, is the DO actually reached a critical point within my fields where my fish became stressed. And although this could be of concern, what it showed me is that actually these fish are pretty smart and a lot more tolerable than we give them credit for. Um, even though that there are these extremes where they would do bad, they always return to more tolerable conditions within the day. And the other thing to remember is that my sensors are very stationary. And so my fish had the ability to move around different parts of my fields where conditions could be a little bit more tolerable for them. And the other, oh, sorry, did not. The other thing is that in these fields, there's a huge amount of food. And so although these fish are stressed, they can offset that energy by having more food available, which is not usually what we see in the Sac River. And finally, we did our acoustic telemetry study. So we deployed 56 cages with 17 fish each at River Garden Farms. We deployed 15 cages at NAGS with 25 fish each. And then we had our control group at UC Davis. The reason these concentrations or these concentrations are a little different is because originally this part of the study was only going to be done at River Garden, but we had some extra cages and we wanted to maximize the number of fish we could put out at NAGS with the number of cages we had available. So at River Garden, we, they were on the fields from February 5th to March 14th, and we completely removed them by March 26th. The thing was, is with that warmer weather, we got concerned that maybe the fish wouldn't do well. And what ended up happening is, as you can see in this bottom center picture, we moved the fish to an irrigation canal, and that ended up being a problem. This irrigation canal is gets water directly from the Sacramento River, which doesn't have a lot of food. And that meant all my fish who are super happy, healthy, and fat ended up losing weight by the time I wanted to tag them. At NAGS, we planted fish on February 12th to March 16th. And in the end, we ended up tagging 290 fish, fish from NAGS and 49 fish from River Garden Farms. We used an SS400 acoustic transmitter, which in this bottom right-hand corner, you can see how small it is. It's actually smaller than a quarter. But because of the fish had lost weight at River Garden, they weren't big enough for me to tag them. So those that were tagged were released on March 16th at Elkhorn Boat Launch Facility, along with 1,600 chaperone fish that were not tagged. And thanks to NOAA, they have this really cool real-time tracker where they can estimate how many of my fish might have made it to Benicia. So right now, from my March release, they suspect that at least 4.4% of those fish had made it to Benicia. Because of COVID-19, by March 18th, Yolo County has started sheltering in place, which is right when I had released my fish. So that meant all those small fish I couldn't tag now had to be brought back to the lab and they became known as my rice lab fish. My control group was originally fish that came from Coleman National Fish Hatchery. And when they finally did obtain a big enough size for me to tag them, we realized that they suffered from a bacterial infection that's quite common in hatcheries. And this meant that I then had to kill all of my control group, wait for the, give them antibiotics, wait for them to get healthy, and then re-tag them. At this point, I didn't have enough fish to do the original control group. So I ended up making two new control groups, one that came from the original hatchery I worked with and another group from the Nimbus fish hatchery. And this is kind of the timeline of the full story of this project. In this first half of the graph, it's the growth data that I showed you up until mid-March. And then you can see between mid-March and mid-April, that was us moving the fish off the field into the lab and waiting for them to get of size. By mid-April, we realized our rice fish could be tagged, but our control fish couldn't, so that just meant more waiting. Um, by the end of April, early May, we had prepped for surgery. And by early May, we actually did our second round of tagging. But like I said, shortly thereafter, my control fish got an infection, which meant I got delayed two more weeks. And then I had to do a third round of tagging right at the end of May, um, which is towards early June, which I'm sure most of you know, that is a really late time to be releasing fish. So for this second fish release, we ended up releasing 300 of our rice lab fish, 213 of our Nimbus control, 
and 109 of our Coleman Control, and we released them at the same boat launch facility at Elkhorn. And this was done on May 31st. And based on the NOAA receivers, they think that only 1.4% of my rice lab fish made it to Benicia, 2.1% made it from the Coleman group and 0.5% from Nimbus. And again, the numbers actually were slightly different for each group because by that point, a lot of my acoustic tags started to malfunction. And so we were only able to use the ones that were working properly. At the same time, although this was late in the year, um, there was a release done by Coleman two weeks before us to see if how many fish would make it from the Coleman hatchery down to Venetia. And their survival was predicted to be 0% at this time. So despite all this, I felt like we learned a lot this year. Uh, the first thing was how difficult it can be to do a controlled scientific experiment in the field. As you can see in that picture, we're trying to repair a berm and we probably spent hours trying to repair the berms of these rice fields. Um, every time you guys heard the wind or the rain, my crew and I were thinking how bad were our berms about to break down. Um, we didn't want water topping over. We wanted to make sure that all of our fish were kept separately. Uh, the other thing that was big to us was that we realized all that work we put in for habitat complexity, it turned out we didn't actually need it, which was a cool thing because this project is helping inform a practice standard for farmers. And it's really nice to tell a farmer that they don't have to add a bunch of Christmas trees to their rice fields to help salmon. The other thing that we learned is how difficult it is to try and keep water flowing through these fields. As you can see in the picture, there's a bunch of rice straw clogging up my screen, and that's terrible. Um, what it does is it disrupts the food flow, so that means there's not new food coming into my fields. It also means that the oxygen in my field is dropping. So when that water runs through the screen, it actually generates a little bit of oxygen, and the fish actually like to hang out at that spot because it tends to be a little cooler. But when it blocks up like that, it causes the water to be stagnant and get really warm, and it seems like like every day we were trying to clean those screens. Um, but in the end, all this hard work wouldn't have been possible without my small army of people to do it. Um, thank you so much to the Yolo Basin Foundation for helping me out. I was able to buy some acoustic receivers to track my fish. And this crew right here was a lifesaver. They always put a smile on my face no matter what fire or pandemic was going on at the time. And just a big thank you to my lab manager and my committee member for letting me call them in the middle of the day, telling them about some other horrible thing that was happening on my rice fields. And that is it. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question, uh, and that is related to the work you had to do to remove um, the fish as you were draining the fields. Is that uh, an issue for using rice in the future in a natural way? I know fisheries biologists always have concern about departing fish or get fish getting trapped. Yeah, actually, so um, the practice standard that they're writing for the farmers, that was something that I advocated that we really needed to stress. Um, I believe there's a certain angle that the fields need to be tilled at. And if they're tilled at that angle, they will drain completely. And so in the practice standard, that's something that they're writing because realistically, like uh, what I was doing to get the fish off the fields, no farmer is going to do that. That's so much time and it's really not practical. So it is something that's really important and it was brought up by management agencies is how to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question that came in. Um, it says, I may have missed it, but is the study toward planting fish in rice? Yeah, I think um, there's definitely a lot of interest in planting more salmon on rice fields, but I think the future of this kind of research is geared more to um, how farmers can modify their fields post-harvest, that if the bypass activates, what can they do to make it so that it's 
better for native fish. Um, obviously, my study was specifically salmon, but I know the direction that most of the scientists want to go in is like, how do we benefit all fish that have access to the bypass? Because um, I think with the new additions that they're making to the Fremont Weir, it's supposed to flood more regularly. We have other questions coming in. I am not seeing other questions. I'll okay. ask another oh, one. Oh, oh, go okay. ahead. Sure. Uh, so what's the plans for the future? Uh, future research or yeah. Uh, well, so for me, this was my final year working on the rice fields, but a lab mate of mine will be doing salmon on the rice fields, but she'll be looking at the stomach content of salmon. So she's looking at the microbiome, like what kind of bacteria do you find in a salmon that grows in the river versus in the rice field? I have, I have a question. You had, uh, you had said that um, I think the straw prevented the water flow out of the fields and that could affect the food coming into the fields. And I mm -hmm. guess I'm wondering what food would come from outside the field versus what is developing from zooplankton cysts, et cetera, inside the fields. Yeah, so the zooplankton that we, that actually feeds the salmon isn't necessarily grown in the field that we house the fish. The way that it's set up to grow salmon on rice fields is you typically have a field that you pump the water from either the river or a well, and you flood up a field that's actually a couple fields away from your study field. And what happens is, is that water slowly moves from that top field down to your bottom field. And during that time, that's where you're growing the zooplankton. And so finally in your bottom field, that's where the fish are located. So their food is actually mostly coming from these upper fields versus the field that they're located in. And so you don't want to block those screens that kept getting blocked. You don't want to block because that's a food that's actually naturally filtering in from those upper fields. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we, we had another comment that um, Yellow Basin Foundation funded a study for 2021 of the bacteria found on the skin of the salmon in the fields. Oh, very cool. And uh, another, the, um, what are the number of fish tracked in each study group? Oh, okay, um, let me see here. Uh, from the first group that we released, let's see. From the first release, we had 295 fish from NAGS and 49 from River Garden. And then for the second release, we had 300 rice lab fish, 213 fish that came from Nimbus and 109 fish that came from Coleman. So um, the original study of design was to tag a thousand fish in total. Um, but in the end, with the number of fish we had available and the number of tags that we're working, it ended up being like 966. All right. Well, super, thanks so much for working on the fish. Thank oh, you. Um, were any of the fish that needed to be terminated fed to the local wildlife? No, so I did not want to uh, feed them to the local wildlife. Um, the bacterial infection they got is something typically found in tanks, so you don't want to release it out into the wild. Uh, what we typically do at UC Davis is the fish that we have to euthanize, it goes into a freezer and eventually it gets sent off to a fish facility that processes it. So it actually sometimes ends up in dog food or fish food, ironically. All right. We had some good questions tonight. So we're going to shift gears here from fish swimming in our rice to bats flying in our sky. Thank you for sharing your information with us. I'm going to move our spotlight and put it over here on our bat team. And uh, 
Anne is going to be sharing um, her time with a couple of the people who worked closely with her on this project. So um, I'm not exactly sure how you're going to do that, uh, but we're going to let you tell us all about it. Okay, great. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay, hopefully that looks all right. Looks great. Okay, great. All right, I am Ann Holmes. I'm a PhD candidate at E. Davis. Um, I'll be talking about a project that um, I've been lucky enough to have funded by the Yellow Basin Foundation uh, two years now. And uh, I'm gonna give an introduction and talk a little bit about the project. And then later in the presentation, uh, two of the undergraduate students who have been working on this now since uh, June 2019, June 2019 are going to come in and talk about uh, some new projects that they're going to be starting up that are actually piggybacking off of our work here. So to get started, um, this project first started, well, the, the idea came in 2018 and the first sampling was summer 2019. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of background about the project and talk about our work over this winter. Um, we were also impacted by COVID. Uh, talk about a, a project that the undergraduate students this spring put together. And then of course the um, upcoming projects that uh, Sarah and Kana are working on. And um, just a brief background. So I um, actually am not a bat specialist. Um, my background is more in aquatic biology, in, um, in fish and in plankton but I used genetic methods and um, a previous project that I had done used genetic methods to look at plankton diets. So I got interested in bats and um, I saw this opportunity to get some more information about the bat uh, populations just locally here uh, in near Davis and to potentially get some information for conservation and provide some learning opportunities, you know, not just for myself, but for some undergraduates. And so I'm so glad I'm doing this project and uh, learning a ton about bats. So uh, as you can see here is a, is a nice bat picking off a moth. And uh, the other picture I've shown is actually one of our sampling traps. So uh, many people here might be familiar with the Yolo Bypass, although maybe not everyone since people may be tuning in from far away. Um, but this is a shot underneath the bridge of Interstate 80 that uh, basically connects Davis to West Sacramento and over to the city of Sacramento. And during the winter time, this area is mostly flooded and then the water recedes in the spring and summer. And so this is a picture taken last summer of our sampling truck, which is actually just a laundry rack purchased from Target with a fresh tarp on top each time. And we put the traps out in the evening, come back in the morning, the bats have left some presents for us. And, uh, and it's, um, it's a pretty, um, in terms of logistics, it's a nice uh, local project that um, is pretty simple to execute in terms of the sample collection. So one reason I got interested in this project um, was of course bats are very charismatic little guys. Um, this is a nice picture. It's actually a corky holding bats that she rescued. This is a Mexican free-tailed bat. You can see uh, these lovely ears that they're using to locate their prey. And this other picture that I have up in the top is a rice field. So these bats live um, under the bridge, as I mentioned, and it's adjacent to a bunch of rice fields. Uh, Davis is located in Yolo County, and obviously next door we have Sacramento in Sacramento County. Um, but these bats have a capability to fly incredibly far every night. So this purple circle I've put here is a radius of 50 miles. The bats can fly up to 100 miles a night. So if they're 50 miles away, they're potentially hitting up to, um, I think it's about 15 counties, maybe the corners of a few more. And so looking at, you know, we are all the way over on the left side is Napa and Sonoma. We've got wine country and uh, over down towards Stockton, uh, there's almond trees. Of course, there's almond trees all the way throughout the Central Valley, also north of Davis. So these bats really have an opportunity to 
um, pick off some pests from a really large area. And of course, there are bats all over the landscape, but this colony under the um, under the bypass is estimated to be about a quarter million. So that's really quite a lot of bats, and, and many people may have seen them already um, and know just the sheer numbers that are out there. So um, what we're doing with this project is trying is we're looking at the guano to get um, to get the DNA sequences to identify the prey. And previously, um, you know, the traditional method of examining uh, bat prey or, or any kind of prey is to do a fecal dissection. And you can imagine that dissecting uh, tiny guano pellets, they're only a couple millimeters in, under a microscope, you know, you might find bits of legs or other bits of insects, but it's really difficult to get a, a picture, a broad picture of all the different species that the bats are consuming. And genetics does quite a good job of uh, connecting all these, you know, tiny bits and digested parts with an actual species name. And with that species name, we can actually put that data into conservation plans and really gain a better understanding of the benefits that bats are providing. So I'm going to go into the details of this genetic method and I'll sort of explain how far we got uh, before COVID uh, became an issue. And, um, and you can see this nice little cartoon has these uh, colorful graphics of species. And, um, and then, so I'll, I'll explain kind of what's going on here. Unfortunately, when we're in the lab, we're just moving around colorless liquids, um, but it's nice to see these cartoons and, um, and to get more details. So uh, we call the, the genetic approach that we're using a barcode. And basically much like a supermarket barcode, that genetic sequence can give us an identification. So this is just an overview of our workflow. On the left, you can see that um, these are, the on the bottom picture is that uh, tarp that I put up on a previous slide. And, uh, and one of the crew, um, either myself or one of the students is actually collecting the guano pellets off the tarp. Uh, we put 10 guano pellets into a sample because um, the, the DNA is sort of degraded and we wanna make sure that there's enough DNA to actually um, give us a good result. And then we um, process these genetic samples. And on the bottom here is the machine that we're using. Um, this is called an Illumina MySeq. It's a genetic sequencer, a high throughput sequencer. There's a number of them at the UC Davis Genome Center. Um, this is sort of a mid-range sequencer. There are more powerful ones and there are smaller ones, um, but it's it really suits the purpose really well. And these sequencers were developed for uh, human medical uses. And then the cost in the last time down quite a bit so we can buy them to these other cool projects. So in order to prepare the DNA for sequencing, we're using, uh, well, we first are isolating the DNA from those samples. So, um, so a, you know, a guano pellet's got some uh, cells and other materials, and we need to have the DNA separated from all those other, um, you know, cell membranes and the um, exoskeletons of insects and things like that, which are problematic. So the a DNA extraction, and then we're using something called a primer. So the primer is what isolates this genetic barcode. And this is really the power of this technology. So it's been applied across a whole range of different uses um, from human microbiomes of different um, types to, you know, you can look at ocean, plankton, um, you know, diets, uh, soil composition. So it really has a broad range of applications. Um, and it's done in two steps. So this is what we worked this winter. So the, the summer was collecting the samples, summer of 2019 was collecting the samples, extracting, extracting the DNA. Um, and then in the winter time, um, we're working on getting these samples prepared. So isolating the barcode and attaching these uh, second primers, which is what the sequencer needs to actually read the, uh, the DNA. So top to bottom, this is kind of a workflow of how the primers isolate and then label the DNA in a way that the sequencer can read it. And um, although with, uh, you know, myself and the undergraduates working on these samples, um, got some samples ready before March, 
you actually need about 100 samples to do the sequencing. So a sequencing run, um, it's about $1,500. You want to run a full sequencer to sort of get your money's worth. And so unfortunately, even though we have some samples ready, we couldn't proceed. And then we had the shutdown and uh, weren't able to get into the lab as much. We're still kind of limited. So we're moving along with the sample preparation and, um, and getting closer to having a sequencing run, but unfortunately no data yet. Um, so we sort of had to turn to while we were slowed down in the lab. And so we skipped ahead from the sequencing and looked into the data part of, um, of this project. So when the sequencer runs the samples, it doesn't provide a species ID. What it does is gives a, a sequence of the nucleotides, so A, T, C, and G, basic DNA that all organisms have. And then it spits out a file that's usually a gigabyte or more. So it's a very large file, um, not something that can easily be looked at on a laptop. In fact, if you try to open it, it, it it'll crash your basic um, home laptop. So we, we look at these sequences, match them to known sequences through um, programs. And putting programs draw on reference sequences from something like the Barcode of Life database. So um, up on the right is just a, a screenshot from the Barcode of Life database showing where they have sequences from. So we're getting closer to having you know, good coverage around the world, but obviously there are lots and lots of organisms, especially when you're talking about insects. I mean, there's tens or hundreds of thousands of insects in our region. And, um, and you really need these high powered coding programs to be able to look at this kind of data. So that is what we ended up doing. Um, we've got, I'm sure lots of people spend lots of time on Zoom. Um, this is a screenshot. So um, Sarah and Kiana, who we'll be talking in a bit are on this and also Cheyenne, who's another undergraduate who finished in June, was working on the project this, uh, this winter and summer. So, um, the lab research turned into Zoom research, and um, one of the ideas that they had for an independent project was actually to create some of these reference sequences, and that was not possible once COVID happened. So um, students did some uh, interviews with folks who are more knowledgeable about insects in our region, and um, and sort of got the basics of working with DNA sequences and these coding skills. Since then, Sarah and Kiana have done uh, a whole workshop uh, using these coding skills. So um, gaining a little bit more fluency with what's basically a new language. Um, and I went through this process a few years ago as a graduate student. So it's, it's really cool that they're starting to get into this. Um, and also working on communicating results. Um, through science communication. So uh, what they were able to do was take this work to the UC Davis Undergraduate Research Conference. It's an annual conference, obviously, sorry, for undergraduates and talk a little bit about um, these backend uh, data analysis um, and reference sequences that they looked into and gained some fluency of. And I, I think it um, also provided a lot more context for how do these methods work? You know, why are we doing things the way that we're doing them in the lab. So it, they had a wonderful presentation. This was also a virtual conference. So they created a video um, and folks came and watched the video and um, had some good comments from UC Davis professors and other folks who, uh, who watched their presentation. So I am going to turn it over um, first to Sarah and then to Kiana to talk about what they're working on. And, um, and so just a little preview. So Sarah's work is also this um, high throughput sequencing method. And it's sort of a, an evaluation of how well our method is working. And then Kiana is looking at a different genetic method called quantitative PCR. It's a comparative method. It's uh, lower throughput, but it's faster and cheaper. So, um, so if you're only interested in you know one species or, or a few, it's a much nimbler type of uh, approach. So I will turn it over to Sarah if I can. 
Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah, and my project is looking at how quantitative metabarcoding is using an insect mock community. So I just want to remind everyone about barcodes and primers. So a barcode is an identifying region of DNA which primers isolate. So in the image with the different colored lines, the bold black line at the bottom represents a barcoding gene. In this case, it's the CO1 gene and the different colored arrows represent different primers that you could use. And this figure really illustrates that all of these primers operate within the same gene. So even with one gene, you can have primers that target different areas and the barcodes um, would be contained within the gray area between the colored arrows. So it just goes to show you that you have a lot of options when thinking about what primer to use, whether it's the location on the gene or how many base, base pairs it is as represented by the numbers. But leading into this project, it's very important to state that no primer is universal, meaning that we can get altered taxon representation due to mismatches of the primer with the DNA template. So sometimes primers don't always work as expected, and it's also possible that Primers work great for one group of insects while maybe having a harder time with another group of insects, for example. So all of this causes primer biases. And the larger study has already collected about 200 guano samples that are going to be processed. And after we get sequencing results, I can use that information to determine what species to focus on for this project. So the species I will be using is dependent on that because we want to see what is present in the guano and what may be underrepresented. So my project involves taking insect specimens, extracting their DNA, and then using this extract to create a mock community, meaning that I will combine known concentrations of extract and test different primers to see how well they can represent those predetermined quantities once we send them in for sequencing. So as for analysis, the main comparison that I'm going to be looking at is relative abundance. So when I send the mock communities to get sequenced and I analyze the results, I will have percentages of the overall results saying 50% of reads are armyworms and 50% of reads are stink bugs, for example. But that doesn't automatically mean that the bats are eating half armyworms and half stink bugs. It just means that for this sample, that's the distribution of reads that we got. So the comparison here is how those percentages differ between primers and how they will and will they be accurate to the amount that I put in. So do the primers produce the expected abundance of those species in the mock community or do they produce something different and how do those primers compare to each other in that sense. So this looks at how well they the primers represent the true amount of biomass consumed as it relates to the bats. So that's the quantitative aspect. We're trying to see if we can draw a parallel between these two ideas. And as an additional interest, I want to see if primer degeneracy affects relative abundance. Primer degeneracy is just a measure of how much variability a primer is willing to allow. So that's having a primer allow for some differences in the template strand and still binding to it versus having a primer with more rigid criteria where it wants a closer match before binding. So it's really just seeing if that's a factor in relative abundance. And overall, seeing the differences between these primers will help inform things like conservation or reserve managers. Um, so they have a more complete understanding of the bats' diets because while metabarcoding can tell us a lot about what's in their diet, due to primer biases, those results can have missing parts to it. There may be things that are underrepresented. So, that is my project, and now Kiona is going to introduce her project, which uses qPCR. So thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Kiona Yearwood, um, and Anne and Sarah have explained the details of metabarcoding and how we've used this method for the bat diet metabarcoding project. But I want to compare metabarcoding methods with qPCR detection. Um, QPCR, or quantitative chain, uh, polymerase chain reaction, is another method used for species detection that monitors the amplification of a targeted DNA molecule during the PCR instead of after, um, and also instead of having to build a metabarcoding library and then sending it to a sequencer and waiting for results. So QPCR overall produces quicker results it's less expensive, and it's also good for focusing on one specific species. 
Um, in order to compare these two methods, I will be analyzing the presence of the brown marmorated stink bug within the Mexican freeze-held bat um, guano using the extracted DNA from the guano samples we collected last summer and then taking them through the qPCR process. Bats are known to be um, natural samplers because they eat agricultural pests and that allows us, allows us to obtain evidence of insect presence in a specific area through their guano more quickly than setting up tra traps and catching the specific insects um, themselves. So I'm focusing on the brown marmorated stink bug because it's a newer nuisance species in California with the potential of becoming an agricultural pest. So using qPCR detection could offer information to farmers for improvements in agriculture, as well as using bats for potential um, population control of pests. Um, the benefit of using qPCR instead of metabarcoding specifically for one species is that it produces results more quickly um, as an early warning detection. So we can see how rapidly the brown marmorated stink bug population could transition into an agricultural pest. However, because we don't have the metabarcoding results yet, it has not been determined if Mexican free-tailed bats are consuming large amounts of the brown marmorated stink bug. So if that is the case, then I'll just refocus my project on a known common agricultural best like the, um, pests like the corn earworm to see its abundance in the Yolo Bypass area. And on the slide, you can see at the top right, that's a picture of the brown marmorated stink bug. And then at the bottom, you can see the larva of the corn earworm. And then of course the bats would be eating the adult because it, it's the, the stage of it flying. Thank you. Okay. Thanks guys. Um, so I'll just close it out and say thank you so much to the Yolo Basin Foundation for funding this work um, and, uh, and the many people who um, helped with the work or provided some back inf background information or gave us access. Um, we just received a lot of support and enthusiasm. So um, it's really been a great project to, um, to be a part of. Thanks so much. And we're happy to take any questions. I'm wondering, is the marmorated stink bug um, reached uh, recognizable densities in the area? Has it become a pest at this point? Or... Go ahead, Kayana, do you know? Okay, so um, we're not sure yet based on the samples we've collected from the Mexican free-tailed bats. So we're just waiting on the meta barcoding samples to come back and then we can see if the bats are consuming them in large amounts. Okay, thank you. Someone also asked if it was an invasive species or if it's native. It is an invasive species. It's not native. It came to the United States around 1996 from I believe some part of Asia. Um, and then it slowly started to spread. So now it's in about 40 states, including California. All right, we had a question of how did you choose your sample locations and how many locations were there? Well, the, um, the sample location, we knew we were gonna sample in the Yolo Bypass. Um, and we thought about sampling, you know, throughout the bypass itself. But for those of us who've been in there, you know that it can take quite a long time to drive from one end to the other. So the roads are not uh, easy access so much. Um, and so we, um, we basically sampled, you know, the traps moved around a little bit underneath the bridge, um, but we sampled right off of, um, off of the frontage road at the very um, east side of Davis. So right before you head over the bypass to, um, to head to Sacramento it's, um, it's great because it was a, you know, a very easy location to get to. That was a huge benefit um, of, you know, gaining experience on this project is a, you know, an easy field site and you can really focus on making, you know, having good science. Um, and so we, we did find that the bats sometimes moved around a little bit um, within, even within that small area. So we didn't always get a sample under the exact same spot. 
um, but we were always in that general general area right by the gate to the Yola Bypass. Um, given a little bit more time, it would be nice to sample further east, um, but it adds about an hour a day to sampling, you know, half hour to get out there on the, the dirt roads and half hour to get back. So as a new project, um, it was, I think logistics were prioritized over a massive sampling effort, but um, at another time, it would be great to add more locations, you know, once we have some initial data. Um, is the production of primers uniform to minimize degeneration or otherwise generate reliable results? Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Is the production of primers uniform to minimize degeneration or otherwise generate re reliable results? So primers aren't created um, with uniform degeneracy. That's part of the, um, the analysis. So different primers are going to be made differently and they also have different levels or I guess yeah, different levels of acceptance. So some primers will have, um, I guess, degenerate nucleotides on them. So they'll allow for multiple different kinds of, um, I guess, like the ACGTs. Some of them will allow for any of them or just a few of them to change. Other primers will be less degenerate, meaning that they want an exact match or a more rigid criteria of what they want to bind to. So that's part of why we're kind of testing everything because um, not only can different primers locate different areas on a single gene, but they also have a different amount of acceptance for what they'll bind to. When do you hope to sequence the samples you collected? Well, we're, we're closing in on 100 samples. So uh, hopefully in the next month, um, we sort of made our initial contact with the Genome Center. So the Genome Center is actually up and running for COVID testing. So they're quite busy, um, but they're still handling academic um, jobs as well. So, um, you know, soon, hopefully um, this month, early next month, um, we've been waiting for data for a long time and <laughs> we'll be really thrilled to see what, um, what we find. Is the supply of guano held back in case you switch from the stink bug to the earworm? So I'm guessing that's Kayana? Yes, yes, there's, um, yes, there's enough guano um, sequence DNA in case I switch from the stink bug to the earworm. I want to tag on that. How come the earworm instead of the army worm? Um, well, the earworm, I was, when I was doing research to find um, what other and in, what insects are commonly eaten by Mexican free tailed bats in this area. The earworm just seemed like it had more support. Um, I could look into the army worm, but I just decided. I mean, there are multiple species in the area that are known to be eaten by Mexican free tailed bats, but I just decided that it. I would want to look at the corn worm, the corn earworm. And it's, there's, yeah, there's, I know there's a lot more on the, um, the earworm, but uh, the reason I asked about the armyworm is because it, that's the, the it's, armyworm is the one that affects the rice. Mm -hmm. And although these guys could go anywhere, I'd like to think they're protecting our rice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question is, um, I'm watching from Baltimore tonight. And I'm wondering if the fires have an effect on the wildlife and the research. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, so we, we were also able to do some uh, collections this summer and uh, you know, generally we were impacted by fire and smoke, um, obviously not in our immediate area and not immediately in uh, bat habitats. Um, you know, we were a little wary of going out when the air quality was really bad. Um, so the, you know, the direct habitat of these bats is, isn't affected, but clearly there are fires in areas that they're capable of flying to. Um, I know there was a study out of, I believe UC Santa Cruz, you know, in a, in a different habitat, 
um, that actually showed that the bats benefited from fire um, in the long run. So it actually opened up new habitat for them. Um, so it, you know, it could be that in the short term, their feeding may be impacted, but in the long term, it creates habitat. Our study wasn't really, we're not really set up to study fire in this study. Um, we're, we're figuring out the methods as you can see, um, but it's a really interesting question. Um, and, um, you know, I'd love to know more about how uh, bats are impacted by fire. Are all the bats Mexican free-tailed or are other species also present at the sampling wrist? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, information from Corky and others um, suggests that in the yellow bypass, it's mostly Mexican free-tailed bats. We actually can also analyze the guano for the bat DNA. So there, some of their DNA um, comes off on their guano. And so that's kind of a subsequent study that we could undertake to at least, you know, it, it may not provide exact numbers, but at least give us um, a hint of what other species might be roosting there, or, or if not, you know, maybe we, um, we look and we only find a Mexican uh, free-tailed bat uh, DNA. It's, it's hard to know. So um, that's a study, DNA, that's a question DNA can answer, um, and, um, and we, we might look at that. Um, but, we, you know, according to the, the best information, there are other species there. They're just not um, the dominant species. And what is the average number of scat you collected on the drying rack in a night? Pretty variable. Um, Sarah and Kiana, do you guys want to um, chime in? I mean, it's... Um, I don't know how to give a good number for an estimate, but it would vary. Sometimes it would be a lot, and sometimes it would be only a few pieces. What's, yeah. a lot? What's the most number? What's the highest number? Oh gosh. Um, well, we wouldn't really like count the amount that would be on a trap, but there were times when the trap was just completely covered in guano. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember, but the traps have troughs in them um, because that's what we basically use to make sure that we actually caught guano and it didn't just fly off with the wind. Sometimes those troughs would be pretty filled with guano and, you know, it's basically just like a guarantee that we're gonna get like all the guano that we want that day. Mm. But sometimes, you know, we even sampled at one point and there was no guano on a trap because the bats completely left. So, you know, we weren't sure why, but they just weren't there. Um, so yeah, it's really variable. Overall though, I would say like we had enough to get about 15 samples of 10 pellets, so. I mean, I would say when the traps were full, there was thousands of <laughs> pellets, I mean, like we, you know, we, we maxed out at, you know, a 10 times 10 or 15. So, you know, we would collect a hundred, um, 150, something like that, you know, and like, like these guys were saying, I mean, there's some, some days the trap is just covered and we go out there in the morning and they're still covering us in guano. We're getting hooked on. So, um, yeah, super variable. Um, they're probably moving around, um, you know, in different spots in the roost, so. Um. So no nightly weighing of traps? Nightly weighing? Was that? that was the question, yes. Oh, um, we did not uh, weigh traps. Yeah, we, um, we kind of collected what we needed. Um, this is a great method because it's non-invasive. Um, it's uh, pretty simple, you know, any, any guano beyond what we needed for our samples was, um, you know, turned back to nature. So, um, so yeah, we, we did weigh the samples that we were sequencing, um, but we didn't weigh the total amount of guano, um, which would be interesting to study, um, just not what we are set up to study for this. Are there are other questions people have tonight? I am not seeing other questions come in. Really exciting. I, I know that it had to have been frustrating for, for both sets of work um, when the, the shutdowns occurred. Um, 
And I, I appreciate that you shared with us a little bit about your struggles and the ways that you overcame um, some of that and the, the work that you're continuing to do. Uh, and look, looking forward to, to seeing what some of those outcomes are too, of course, from the personal side, because I want to know what those guys eat, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I'm thrilled that we had so many people come this evening, uh, learn a little bit about salmon, learn a little bit about bats. Um, next month, again, uh, we're going to be having a presentation about the red fox. And I'm hoping that we'll learn a little bit about the red fox. The, I'm pointing to our demonstration area here, um, that visits us uh, at night and uh, leaves us some, I don't know, do you call, you call it scat? I, know, I guess you don't really call fox droppings guano, do you? Yeah. 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 Um, and maybe we'll learn about their scat too. I don't know. Um, again, we're Yolo Basin Foundation. We're the nonprofit organization here. Um, that does all the education programs and advocacy work for the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. Um, Bucks for Ducks is right around the corner. Uh, if you're on our email list, you should be getting information and you can see some of our videos that we've been doing, um, showing you a little bit about how we're still doing outreach and sharing with our school groups. And um, we're getting ready to get going on our, our Saturday tours, and um, we're even thinking about how, what is Duck Day is going to look like in February, uh, and all that kind of good stuff. So, wonderful art, wonderful photos. Uh, so, I hope that uh, we see you. Gosh, that's just a week away at Bucks for Ducks. All right. So, thank you so much tonight. Uh, thank you to our, our researchers for joining us this evening, um, and thank you to all of our participants for coming and and uh, hearing a little bit about the projects. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good job, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I can't wait to hear the results. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be patient. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know for sure. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Brilliant job. Bye. Bye. Bye.